Let's turn to the first epistle of John, um, chapter 3, reading from verse 16. Hereby we have known love, because he has laid down his life for us, and we ought for the brethren to lay down our lives. But whoso may have the world's substance and see his brother having need, and shut up his bowels from him, how abides the love of God in him? We're going to look at this um, verse, verse 16, in two parts. Firstly, to consider what Christ has done. And then secondly, to consider what we ought to do. Now, the first part refers to his sacrifice in a, in a very special way. And I'll need to take quite a long road to demonstrate this. The second part issues a challenge to us as Christians. And um, for that, I'll need to take a very difficult road to pass this challenge on. So the long road. Um, there, are, there was a special occasion when the Lord Jesus, during his life, went up the Mount of Transfiguration when two men spoke with him, Moses and Elijah. And it says in Luke chapter 9 that they were speaking to him of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. And this departure is spoken of in the New Testament in a, quite a variety of ways. It's, um, by, by looking at these different ways, we, we might get something of an impression of what is intended by the Apostle John when he speaks about the Lord Jesus laying down his life. But um, this one, I'll leave to last. The first way in which his departure is spoken of is that Scripture says that he died and for this, we can, we can turn to um, several scriptures, Romans chapter 5, for example, Romans 5 verse 6 says, um, for we being still without strength in the due time, Christ has died for the ungodly, He's died for the ungodly. Verse 8, Romans 5. God commends his love to us in that we being still sinners, Christ has died for us. He died for us. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. I delivered to you in the first place what also I had received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Died for our sins. And then lastly, in 2 Corinthians Chapter 5, read from verse 14. For the love of the Christ constrains us, having judged this, that one died for all, then all have died. So he died for the ungodly. He died for us. He died for our sins. He died for all. Another way in which his departure is spoken of is particularly um, mentioned by the Apostle John. And that is, he says that the Lord Jesus was lifted up. I want to read the scriptures that refer to this in John chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 14, firstly. Says, and Moses and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, thus must the Son of Man be lifted up, that everyone who believes on him may not perish, but have life eternal. It speaks of his lifting up as a divine necessity. He must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. But it sets him forth also as a present object for our faith that everyone who believes on him may not perish, but have life eternal. Then 
In John chapter 8, he's spoken of as lifted up, verse 28. Jesus therefore said to them, when ye shall have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father has taught me, I speak these things. This is now his lifting up on the part of Jewish wickedness. And in his exaltation, it takes us on to a time when they will know that, as he says, I am. And this, this would take in also his future appearing for the nation of Israel. And that lastly, um, John speaks of his being lifted up in chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 32 says, And I, if I be lifted up out of the earth, will draw all to me. I will draw all to me if I be lifted up out of the earth. This is now his own personal victory, something he accomplishes himself. And it um, will really find its total fulfillment in the millennium when all men are drawn to him. So as to his departure, he died, he was lifted up. Now, thirdly, another way scripture speaks of that departure is that he was delivered up. And this is an expression mostly used concerning Judas Iscariot. Um, and one example of the way this is used is in John chapter 18. And it says for, in verse 5, And Judas also who delivered him up stood with them. It speaks to us this word of, of, of a, a, a treacherous betrayal on the part of Judas delivering up the Lord Jesus into wicked hands. But it's also used concerning Pilate in the next chapter, John 19, verse 16. It says, Then therefore he delivered him up to them that he might be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. On Pilate's part, it was, was, was not the thought of treacherous betrayal, but rather an abdication of his personal responsibility, handing over the responsibility of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus to the Jews. But then it also says of the chief priests in Luke 24, read that verse, <clears throat> Luke 24, verse 20, and, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to the judgment of death and crucified him. The chief priests delivered him up. But perhaps the most touching reference of all in connection with the Lord Jesus being delivered up is when in Romans 8, it says in verse 32, He who, yea, has not spared his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him grant us all things? He was delivered up by Judas. He was delivered up by Pilate. He was delivered up by the chief priests. And ultimately, he was delivered up by God. But then, more than that, the scripture tells us that he delivered himself up. And, and this, is, this is the same word, the very same word used for what it says that Judas did to him. The scripture tells us that he delivered himself up. And we can read of that in a well-known verse in, in Galatians chapter 2. I'm going to read it using the translation of that very same word. Galatians 2 verse 20 speaks of the Son of God who has loved me and delivered himself up for me. And then in Ephesians chapter 5, it speaks of the Christ 
even as the Christ loved us and delivered himself up for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. And then also in chapter 5 and verse 25, the Christ also loved the assembly and has delivered himself up for it. Not only was he delivered up by Judas, delivered up by God. He delivered himself up. He loved me. He loved us. He loved the assembly. He delivered himself up for me, for us, and for the assembly. But another expression that's used of his departure is that he gave himself. Galatians, again, chapter 1, verse 4. It says, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. First Timothy 2, it says, he gave himself, verse 6, First Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all. And then Paul's epistle to Titus in chapter 2. Verse 14, who gave himself for us. He gave himself for our sins. He gave himself a ransom for all. He gave himself for us. Another expression concerning his departure is used in 1 Corinthians 5, That's verse 7. <clears throat> Is for also our Passover, Christ has been sacrificed. He was sacrificed. Now, um, usually the word translated here, sacrificed, is given as killed. And evidently it depends on the context as to how it should be translated. Here, translated sacrificed in a, in a, a unique kind of way. Christ, our Passover. Scripture also tells us that he was crucified. And this expression really emphasizes the guilt of the Jews in putting him to death. And some examples of that would include Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. <clears throat> As him given up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye, by the hand of lawless men, have crucified and slain. Paul preached Christ crucified. The scripture tells us he was crucified in weakness. It tells us in the book of Revelation that he was crucified in the city spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, that city. Jerusalem. When scripture tells us he was crucified, that's not something he did to himself. That's not something God did to him. It's something done to him by man and especially by the Jews who bear the guilt of having crucified him. Scripture tells us too that he was slain. We just read that in Acts 2, verse 23. We could read it also, Acts 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers has raised up Jesus, whom ye have slain, having hanged upon a cross. First Thessalonians 2 takes the theme a little further. <clears throat> First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15. The Jews who have both slain the Lord Jesus and the prophets, as with his crucifixion, his being slain also emphasizes the guilt of the Jews in putting him to death. And one more expression concerning his departure. The scripture speaks in a, in a lovely way of his obedience. 
And we should read Romans chapter 5, firstly, for this. Romans 5, verse 19. For as indeed by the disobedience of the one man, the many have been constituted sinners, so also by the obedience of the one, the many will be constituted righteous. This is not speaking of him obeying the law during his life. This is speaking of his one act of obedience in contrast to Adam's one act of disobedience. Adam's act brought condemnation to all men. That one act of the Lord Jesus has brought about justification for those who trust him. Philippians 2 speaks of that obedience again in a well-known and beautiful way. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So summarizing these, these few expressions, he died. He, he died as our substitute. He died instead of us. He died as our representative, not only instead of us, but representing us so that we can also be considered to have died. He was lifted up. He was lifted up as one who was rejected by men, but also lifted up as one who's exalted by God. He was delivered up. And that, that speaks of something that, that's, that's unnatural, something undeserved, something unexpected. The, the fact that he would do it to himself, deliver himself up, is in each instance spoken of as a, as a supreme act of love for me, for us, for the assembly. When it says he gave himself, it emphasizes that he was a willing substitute instead of those who ought to have been in the place that he took. When it says he was crucified and slain, the scripture emphasizes human guilt. When it says he was obedient unto death, it emphasizes that he was submissive to the will of God. But there's one more expression, the last of the expressions, and that's the one that we have to take up now. The scripture tells us that he laid down his life. And firstly, in, in seeking to understand this, we need to turn to John chapter 10. Verse 11, <clears throat> John chapter 10, verse 11. The Lord Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Further on, verse 15, as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Again, verse 17, on this account, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it again. I have received this commandment of my father. There's another reference in chapter 15, 15, verse 13. No one has greater love than this, that one should lay down his life for his friends. And we can quote again from our verse, 1 John 3.16. Hereby we have known love, because he has laid down his life for us. And we ought for the brethren to lay down our lives. One, one thing should be clear to us, that this expression, laying down his life, is not a synonym for all of the other terms that we noticed, were used to describe the Lord's departure. We can't substitute any of the other terms for it. If we attempt to do it in, in our verse, 1 John 3, 16, this will become very, very obvious in the second part of the verse, 
where John applies the term laying down our lives to us. But let's just try it. He's died for us, and we ought for the brethren to die. No. He's been lifted up for us, and we ought for the brethren to be lifted up. That doesn't work either. He's been delivered up for us, and we ought for the brethren to be delivered up. No. He's been crucified for us. We ought for the brethren to be crucified. He's been slain for us. We ought for the brethren to be slain. Been sacrificed for us. We ought for the brethren to be sacrificed. We, we, we just know intuitively that in, in application to us, none of these can represent John's intended meaning in the expression. Come back to John chapter 10. In this, the Lord spoke of something that characterized him as the good shepherd. He speaks of something that he would do on behalf of others, the sheep or his friends, or in our case, the brethren. The laying down of the life is something done on behalf of others. In his epistle, John speaks of it as something that Christ has done. But as he records it in the gospel, it speaks of it as something that the Lord Jesus was in the process of accomplishing. Now, that's an expression that's unique to John in the New Testament. There's one other reference in John where we might get a little bit of help in understanding the meaning. And this is John's reference to Peter's bold assertion. Turn to John 13, <clears throat> verse 37. Peter says to him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thee. Jesus answered, Thou wilt lay down thy life for me? Verily, verily, I say to thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now, let's have a look at the way Luke records this same event. In Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> Luke 22, verse 33. And he said to him, Lord, with thee I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow today before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. What did Peter have in mind? Peter was, was, was thinking of having a, a willingness to put himself at risk, even if that risk ultimately meant dying. He wasn't actually thinking of death, but he was thinking of making a personal risk that could potentially end in death. Now, we, we know that, um, we know from the inspired record that, that Peter was thinking too highly of himself. He, he was too self-confident in this. But that doesn't change what, what he meant by what he said. He was thinking of going even to prison, even to death. And in expressing this, John uses the term, lay down my life. We can think of um, other ways by which to understand the expression. Um, if, if we look just at the that 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 part of the expression laid down, the, the root word for laying down on its own is, is quite common in the New Testament. And it has the idea of deliberately and carefully acting 
to put something in a particular place. Now, if we connect with the term laid down, the word life, in the New Testament, only John, as I've already said, only John uses that expression. But the expression laid down in connection with life was used in classical Greek texts. And in every instance in those, that has the meaning of putting your life at risk, just as Peter intended it when he said, I'll lay down my life for thee. Another, another help would be to consider the way the, the Septuagint, the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses the expression, because there are several instances where lay down and life are put together in the Septuagint. And one, one classic example is in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 5. Well, I'll, I'll read it as it is in the English Bible. First so Samuel 19, verse 5. <clears throat> this is Jonathan speaking about David. For he put his life in hand and smote the Philistine. Put is exactly the same word in Greek as in the New Testament, translated laid down. For he laid down his life in hand and smote the Philistine. Jonathan was emphasizing the great risk David had taken on behalf of Israel in opposing Goliath, the Philistine. Now, of course, what John records about the Lord Jesus goes beyond just putting his life at risk. It goes all the way to his actual giving up of his life in death. But perhaps we can put it like this, that it refers not only to death itself, but to his entire course of self-sacrifice in life and in death. Now we're in a position to see how John applies this to us. He says that we ought for the brethren to lay down our lives. And Peter and David have shown us examples of it. One's a negative example and one's a positive example. And, and the Apostle John, in the verse I read at the beginning, um, verse 17, gives us another example of it also a negative example of seeing a brother in need when we ourselves have this world's goods, this world's substance, and doing nothing about it. I suspect that most of those who wrote commentaries had exactly the same problem as me when they came to 1 John 3.16. I've read as many as I've been able to, and they almost all seem to avoid saying much about the second part of the verse. And this is the problem. How dare I say anything about the second half of the verse? How can I exhort you to do something that I haven't put into practice personally? Could, can, I, can I dare do that? But then I think about John himself. Now, if he meant by laying down our lives for the brethren, if he meant dying, John wasn't dead. How could he tell us to do something that he himself hadn't done? We know in, in, in the case of the Apostle Paul, he frequently said, be my imitators. Could John say that? If, if to lay down one's life meant to die, could John say, be my imitators? 
No, I'm sure he could. He was still alive. But what was his life? What choices had John made in his life? How was he spending his life? Did he not lay down his life for the brethren while he lived? You know, it, if it came to the crunch, I think many of us would be willing to die instead of our brethren. But that's not the question, is it? The question really is, are we willing to live for them? What choices are we going to make in our lives? What choices have we made in our lives? Choices about our education, our career, our home, where we live, our family, our money, our possessions, our time. What choices have we made? What choices are we going to make? Just a few examples. Hmm. Many will have heard of a brother named William Kelly. Now, he was offered employment with the promise that he would make him a fortune in the world. His answer was, which world? I know a brother, I won't name him, who deliberately changed his study preferences with the result that his future potential income would be halved. And he made that choice for this very reason. If, if he'd continued with his original choice, his original stream of study, he would have had no life left to lay down for the brethren that would have been devoted to other things. Harry Ironside wrote about a young sister, a sister named Fanny Arthur, whose life was cut short by malaria while she was serving women and children in Central America. But, um, her death occurred 106 years ago, just last month, and she wasn't quite 30 years old when she died. You know what he called the book? He called the book, A Life Laid Down. At the present time, many of us know of another sister, still living, who gave up one of her kidneys for a brother in her local gathering. All of us know of the Apostle Paul. And in Philippians 1, Paul speaks as if he'd been given the choice to depart and be with Christ or to remain. Much better or to remain. And his choice was to remain. Why? He said, it's more necessary for your sakes. In these brothers and sisters, I can say men of like passions. We see lives laid down. But what a variety. A variety in the way their lives were laid down. There was a life laid down in foregoing earthly advantages, all the earthly advantages that natural ability might bring. A life laid down in devoted service that caused exposure to disease and resulted in death. A life laid down by risking health and well-being. A life laid down by choosing not to die, but rather to remain here in service for the brethren. I have to conclude with this. And I have to ask you the very same thing that I ask myself. In what way? Are you going to lay down your life for the brethren?